Welcome once again to Arctic Fire. This unique gathering of swordsmiths explores the outer edge of the craft, where craftsmanship, artistry, storytelling, history, and myth combine. This year, the group has recreated objects found in the legendary horde of Grendel, from the most ancient surviving poem in Old English, Beowulf. Four days of live broadcast in which legends will be reborn. Arctic Fire 2016, Grendel's Horde. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow sword geeks and bladesmiths, welcome back to Arctic Fire 2016. Uh, I have the honor to uh, make the first individual presentation of a number you're going to see in the coming hours and days. Today, I will talk about the searching for a horde. And not just any horde, it's the horde of Grendel, Grendel's <coughs> horde. This project began at an end. And now I tell you, listen, because I'm about to tell you a story where the fantastic will be sitting nearby the everyday. We're going to venture into the land of the trolls where you might not be able to trust your senses. So beware. There are trolls lurking here. Um, you might have heard about uh, the project we did in 2013, which was the making of an artifact. Um, <coughs> it was a riddle project uh, with clues involved, and um, it was a fantastic experience. It was broadcast, and for those who watched, they could, they could see clues being presented as to the identity of the object and where it was hidden. And um, Dave was contacted by a man who um, had seen this and um, was fascinated by this object. And the fact that we approach ideas of um, the artifact as a storytelling device and the thing of, of history, real and imagined. And he had in his possession um, some materials, some objects that he had got as an inheritance from a relative. And he thought that this may be of interest to us. So um, he wanted to remain anonymous. He is involved with internet security and doesn't want to reveal his name, so his identity shall remain hidden. He is, however, a relative to a lady, uh, late lady uh, Bente Lewis, um, born Christensen, who is the daughter of a man who has been the center of this story, a man called uh, Gotthard Mörkvinter. This man, if you know about him, might be because um, He's come down to history as a traitor of his country. To what extent he was truly a traitor, we will not really know, but we do know that he was fascinated with the ideas of, of uh, Germanic history and Norse myth, and um, he was very sympathetic to the movement in the early 20th century in Germany that developed into the uh, Nazi uh, terror. Um, he was independently rich. Uh, at an early age, he <coughs> came into a fortune that was created by his father, who was involved in, in the Danish colonies, first on the Gold Coast, on Africa, in Ghana, and then later on in the Danish West Indies. And on this rather impressive fortune, he could indulge himself in his history of, or his interest in, in history and, and archaeology. So he sponsored private excavations, he, he collected originals, both those who he was sort of secured by the excavations, but also bought into his collection. And he studied these and also studied Germanic myth and, and uh, he published material. Um, this is, for example, um, 
uh, an, uh, pages from an article published in the periodical I Fahr Fedrenspor, uh, the year 1932. I'm, I'm not German speaking. This means uh, a group of unusual daggers from the Iron Age. And uh, here he presents uh, a group of fascinating pieces that are not so widely known uh, because they're difficult to, to classify. Um, this one, uh, for example, shows some similarities to daggers found in the Jutspring find, um, one of the earliest bog finds in Norse uh, Nordic history from the sort of 350 BC. It has a blade shape uh, that is very reminiscent of, of one of these daggers. However, it's much, much larger. It's almost in the size of being a short sword. So it's a massive piece, um, uh, very little remains of the hilt, but it has some interesting features. So make note, for example, of the uh, lines in the blade and the way uh, the hilt is attached. Uh, another was found um, in the area south west area of Germany, the Black Forest area, um, when a huge oak uh, fell to the ground and in, under its roots revealed this dagger. Um, this was near Schloss Hohendorf um, in, in south uh, west Germany. And what's interesting is that the hilt shows clear similarities to some um, uh, Hallstatt period uh, daggers. The scabbard um, is made of sheet metal with a punched decoration in the shape of, of a head, of a face. And from the carrying ring, there is a little silver chain whereupon is strong teeth, human teeth. So it's a rather grim piece. Um, this one uh, was found uh, in the late 1920s uh, during peat harvesting um, outside um, uh, Rostock. And uh, it was found together with a bundle of broken and scorched human bones. What was interesting with this dagger, and what caused quite some uh, controversy, is the fact that o the overall shape of it is very, very similar, again, to some of these Hallstatt daggers that are dated to around 6700 BC. However, the pommel of this dagger is very, very similar. Well, it it is unique to pommels of high medieval swords. And it's also of an unusual size. The width of it is, is uh, 12 centimeters over the widest part of the blade. So it's a huge piece. Um, again, uh, a remarkable and rather morbid find was um, in a grave of a knight, at least supposed knight, uh, close to um, the Battle of Saule in Lithuania, where the, the, the order of the sword, the sword brethren, were soundly beaten by um, some Igalians in the year of 1237, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's believed that this man may have been killed in the battle. Um, we can't be sure of that, however. At, at his feet is a uh, like a, there was remains of a, of a casket or a chest of wood uh, with iron bindings. Inside this were fragments of a, of a very large skull. On top of the lid, there is this dagger or short sword, which is remarkable in that uh, it has silver decorations on the scabbard, enhancing the features of a face. Again, the face is sort of part of it. And the rivet washers that attaches the blade to the guard is actually Roman silver coins. So again, we have this strange sort of anachronistic nature of these daggers. And this is one reason they, there aren't really any great interest for that in common academia. They are difficult to approach. Gotthard was also interested in, uh, in the mythological part of, of uh, this world at this time. And he, together with, with this publication of the daggers, he republished this um, um, drawing of a Pressbleck. Um, 
The article uh, occurred in uh, the periodical Fornvenden in 1928, I think, and um, the author is um, Brage, Gunnar Brage. Um, and Gotthard pointed out that the dagger that this um, figure is holding in, in, in uh, her hand is very, very similar to those daggers of this group. And it's believed that this Pressblech is actually depicting one of the epic moments in the Beowulf poem, which is the fight between Beowulf and Grendel's mother. Um, you can see Beowulf in his left hand is holding a sword that is, seems to be broken and obviously failed in its task, and his right hand he is impaling the mother with this oversized or huge sword. Uh, in the upper corner of the image is the torn off head of the henchman or, or advisor that uh, Grendel's mother abducted from the hall. And in the other upper corner, you can see a, um, a decapitated snake, which might be one of the sea monsters he uh, uh, sort of w was fighting on the way down in the lake. You can also see what is very probable the torn off arm of uh, Grendel that Grendel's mother secured from the hall and, and brought back with her. And this is one of the first rather peculiar coincidences of this journey I've been on ever since taking on the study of, of the objects of this hoard. Um, this May, the English reenactment group or living history group of Wolf Hedenas visited Uppsala and made a display in old Uppsala showing the pieces. And we also together did a visit in the storerooms of um, uh, the archaeological uh, collection of Uppsala University. They wanted to study the pieces from Bendel and Valsjärd, all the obvious reasons. And together with Dave Roper, I, um, we went to look for good pieces to be reproduced and, and studied closer. And in one of the drawers uh, where you have unidentified, un, uh, sort of finds without a number, without a find location, lo and behold, we found what we believe is actually the original piece that is the piece that is depicted in this drawing. And this is quite remarkable. We, we notify the people who uh, curate this collection and uh, there, will, there might be further publications of this. This is uh, uh, one of the nice spin-off effects of this one. Um, now I would like to come to a different part of this presentation and that is the study of the troll or troglodology. This is a field of study uh, that has a few centuries behind it, actually. Um, when we talk about Norse myth, this part of it that goes way back before the sagas of Thor and Odin and, and the, the Norse gods that we recognize, back into a history that is silenced to us. We don't know the myths that were told and, and, and that, that occupy the imagination of the people of the Bronze Age but we do have their images sometimes. And these are uh, rock carvings that show the sun, you see traces of, of journeys as, as footprints, you see um, religious um, uh, ceremonies and you sometimes see, f see fighting. And in some of these images you, 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 you can gather that it's humans interacting with gods or possibly trolls. Um, and this was something that fascinated uh, our Gotthard. Um, we need to understand that the troll is an active figure in folklore up to very, very recent times, perhaps even today. And in folklore, the traditional role of the troll is that uh, the troll is, is like, it's, it's greedy, it lives in, in the wilderness, mountains, forests, as in the case of Grendel and his mother, it's, it's a lake. It abducts the innocent, it hoards silver and riches, and it has the ability to twist your mind. It can make you believe things that are not true. It can make you doubt what you take for granted, and it will lead you astray. 
And this was a, a, a strong element in, in folklore. Uh, this is famously depicted in, in the illustrations of Jan Bauer. Uh, we have other impressions of the troll, however, being not so clearly sinister. There is a story retold by Alcuin, the famous scholar who was uh, active at the court of Charlemagne in the ninth century. He was called to the court by Charlemagne when he already had a bit of, of um, career behind him. He had a rumor of being a, an eminent philosopher with very deep scholar, uh, scholarly knowledge of philosophy. He also, he was a very, very pr prominent teacher. Um, so Charlemagne wanted him at his court to elevate the status and, and to, to teach his, um, his people. At this time, Alcuin tells us in a letter to the Bishop Arno of Salzburg, when he came to the court of Charlemagne, Charlemagne had received a gift from one of his vassals in Berman. The gift was nothing less than a troll in chains that was transported to the court in a cage. And there were scholars already at court who felt somewhat threatened by Alcuin's presence. They were envious of him, jealous. So some of them started to spread a rumor, we are told, that Alcuin, in his pride, said, I can make a good Christian out of this troll. Um, of course, this was a great joke. Um, the emperor, however, in his wisdom, he knew Alcuin, he is a man of knowledge. So he gives him the task, officially, please convert this troll, make a Christian out of him. And Alcuin accepts and spends quite some time together with this troll in the dungeon and um, uh, trying to educate him. And indeed, the troll picks up on Latin and rhetoric and dialectics. And, and Alcuin notes that after some time, he's quite as skilled in these arts as many of the other scholars at court. However, the troll refuses to be baptized. He refuses to become Christian. And... Um, the joke grows lame after a while, and unfortunately the, the troll is put on the pyre and killed, despite Alcuin's prayers and, and interjections, please, please spare him. But um, the troll is dead, and uh, Alcuin mas makes his famous statement that you can force a man to be baptized, but you cannot make him uh, truly believe uh, by, by threat of violence. And we, we commonly this is thought to have to do with the uh, the, the, the enforced uh, Christianization of the Saxons. But indeed, it has to do with this uh, troll uh, story. Um, we also have the story, the, the troll present as this object of creature of terror and um, the element of the troll cult in sort of appeasing the troll um, and also perhaps using its power to, to scare away enemies can be seen in these stele, these um, like, uh, like almost like sculptures of, of figures. Uh, normally these show heroes or gods or kings, but some of them are of a different nature. And you may recognize some similarities between them. This is a famous example uh, from Poland near Biskupin, thought to date from around the second century AD. And you may note how it holds two human figures in its hands, and there is this wide-bladed dagger with a scabbard that bears a face. Um, the second one is uh, known as the Old Man at the Cross. It was destroyed during the Civil War in England. It was between um, the road from Salisbury uh, down in, in Cornwall. Uh, it had, in folk belief, it had to do with, with uh, the, the, the giving of promises and also some kind of fertility um, uh, myth around it. The only thing we have to this day are this, this de depiction of it. And finally, we have uh, this, uh, the top of a staff found in the bottom of a well in Dublin. The well dates to the Viking Age, and it may actually depict Grendel's mother. Uh, it's a, it's a she-troll. You can again see the dagger with the faced scabbard, and uh, she's about to devour a, a human being. Quite grim. 
there are some famous scholars who looked into this uh, area of research, and, and a preeminent one is uh, Carl Linné, who made a journey to the uh, northern part of Sweden, Lapland, um, in the 1730s. He came back with a full shamanic equipment with a drum and, and uh, all the accoutrements and made quite a s uh, success of this. Uh, depicted beside it, you will see um, a rather unusual uh, noid or shaman drum that is said to be f a battle drum to face trolls in spiritual battle. Depicts the, the Sami pantheon at the top and you can see uh, the faces of the moon and, and runes of power. So there is this um, connection between the Aboriginal or original population of Sweden as the Sami and the trolls. There is this uh, indeed um, the scholar Jakob Friedrich Neikter in the late 18th and, and century. He wrote a story um, a work called um, Gente Antiqua Troll or the Ancient Troll Nation where he talks about the trolls being the, the original population of Sweden that was pushed away by the more modern people and uh, he claims that these are actually the forefathers of the Sami nation. Uh, Gunnar Olof Hilten Cavalius is a later scholar who also studies this question and uh, he claims that witches, he doesn't at all refute their existence and he claims they are actually descendants of trolls. Um, this brings us back to the modern era and again connects to Gotthard. Um, there was a young man, uh, Elias Mistelgren, who was a student, a follower of Hermann Lundborg. And this is a very dark chapter in Swedish history. They, um, Hermann Lundborg was the head of the uh, State Institute for Racial Biology, and he was a strong proponent of eugenics, that is racial hygiene. And they were interested in classifying humans into races and putting them on a scale of varying sort of purity. And to do that, they, they studied proportions and the features of people, measuring them and classifying them accordingly. And um, these ideas, these very dark ideas, actually formed the basis of uh, understanding also in the Third Reich in Germany, which is well, the source of, of uh, many of the nightmares of the 20th century. Um, this is one of the instruments used by them for, for the measuring of, of people. Elias Mistelgren was also interested in the folklore of the Sami people and he contacted Gotthard to fund his research trip to northern Sweden, northern Finland and also into northwest Russia. And uh, Gotthard, knowing that he could get some more material about these fascinating questions. He funded this trip, and um, there is a correspondence from Elias Mistelgren back to the University, Lundborg, and also to Gotthard. So we know a little bit of this trip and what happened. He came finally to a place, uh, Sieto Cerdo, in uh, northwest Germany, no, <laughs> Russia, which is a lake, a holy lake for the Sami people. And there is a legend attached to it that has to do with the defeating of a magic-wielding giant by one of the sky gods who hurled the lightning and incinerated this thing. Um, this place is taboo to, to come close to, but Elias approached a curiously shaped boulder. His guides refused to follow him. And underneath that boulder, he found a bundle of bones tucked away. And what he saw there astounded him. He he made some first preliminary sketches and measurements. He sent one piece home uh, together with a letter where he said, I'm going to abort the rest of the mission, uh, coming home as quickly as I can, uh, securing these valuable bones, but just take this as an as a, uh, introduction of what I'm going to show you. So we, unfortunately, we only have his words and this first remain that he sent home, which was a claw, a, a bear-like claw, but much larger. 
Um, there were conflicts in the group. His guides were not quite... Um, well, they didn't like him. He, was, he wasn't treating them well. And he didn't make it back. We don't know why. He might have been taken by Russian border controls or possibly he just went lost and perished in the wilderness or some even more sinister fate uh, came to him. We don't know today. We, we only know that he, he disappeared in nine, uh, 1939 on his way back. Um, following this trail, I, I checked the, the letters, uh, the, the words uh, given to us in the letters to Gotthard and also in the archives of the university, we have the correspondence of Lundborg preserved. So there was enough there to seek this remain, this proof that he sent home. And everything pointed at this being kept in the collection of uh, the Museum of Evolutionary Bi Biology uh, in Uppsala. So I, I asked if I could go there and have a look, and I was welcomed. It is in a state of refurbishment, so what you meet is quite uh, surrealistic. You have a, a museum where all the stuffed animals are in, in clusters and groups. They're like almost like you interrupt a conversation between them and you come into the room and, and they, they just start to look at you, frozen. <laughs> and um, in one corridor you have this uh, haphazard meeting between uh, a family of, of moose and, uh, and a bison. Uh, uh, a stuffed fish swinging on, on dry land, and you can, in the distance, you can you can glimpse a lion, which is actually a stuffed lion from the late 17th century. Uh, the guy who stuffed it had no idea what a lion looked like. Uh, and behind that lion, in a stack of shelves or, or um, drawers, indeed, there was the claw. And that was quite a, a charged moment when I could pick it up and, and examine it firsthand. And it looked nothing like anything of, of the other pieces, like the claws you saw on bears and stuff. And, and this, I think, have sparked again some new curiosity in this case. It's sort of the whole, the whole heritage left behind by uh, Lund Mori is sort of, it's uncomfortable to approach. So that's one reason why these things haven't really been looked into. But maybe it's time again to, to look at this from a new angle and try to classify this. Uh, Elias Mistelgren was convinced that he had found something that was quite remarkable, revolutionary. But quite what it was, no one has come forward and say what it is. We, we can only be left to guess. So, this brings me to Gotthard's involvement in the Horde, finally. And the Horde, the Horde of Grendel, is also known as the treasure of Thursholt. Thursholt is believed to be a root of Thursa, or giant, and Holt is a word for small forest. So, it's the, 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 the village is named Giant's Forest. Uh, it is on, on Sealand, in Denmark, um, and quite close to Leire. Uh, it's a beautiful landscape. Um, you can see it on the map here. It's just smack in the middle of, of uh, Sealand. This area is filled with remains of really ancient times. You have Neolithic graves. You have um, tombs of the ancients. You have a lot of shallow lakes. And many of those were holy lakes made for, used for offerings. You have uh, uh, beechwood forests and you have the undulating hills. Uh, it's a, a rich, beautiful farming land and, and these fantastic, fantastic uh, features. On top of this very hill is actually where they quite recently made excavations and found what might very well be the whole Herod. It's a hall from the 6th century of huge dimensions that fits very well to the descriptions of the poem. So, if you were coming with the warband together with Beowulf walking up the hill, you can imagine a huge hall, almost in the shape of a, of a um, state church, but much longer, 
with this high roof decorated with the, the antlers, and this must have been an awesome sight, dominating the landscape. Um, in the year of 1848, a young man called Torben Sørensen runs away from home. He's 15 years old, and he's about to enlist in the war against Germany. His father is a landless farmhand, poor conditions, but he's determined to strike out and try to make his luck. As it happens to be, he passes a place just behind the forest that shields him from the village of Thursholt, um, and he comes upon um, a sinkhole in the limestone hill beside a, a field. This field has come down in local knowledge as the field of bones, because in this time you, you needed more farmland, so the wetlands, the bogs and the shallow lakes, they were ditched and the water was led away and the, the, the either it was used for peat harvesting or actual grazing or farmland. And this turned out to be, the, the field of bone turned out to be an unusually fertile field. However, by every spring, when the thaw was breaking, bones were pushed up to the surface. And quite a few of these were human bones. And because of that, came to have a rather sinister reputation, this place. Um, there was a series of summers with very little rain, which lowered the water table further, even after the ditching. And then a summer of great uh, deluge and a very wet spring, the wet spring of 1848. And it's believed that this shifting of the water table up and down uh, sort of provoked further erosion of the limestone, which uh, made the, the sinkhole open up. So Torben Sørensen, you can see him here as a middle-aged man, a little bit later in his life, after a series of adventures. He's a slim 15-year-old. He crawls down the hole and comes upon a, a system of, of channels, tunnels, and caves. And under the caved-in roof in one of these, he finds astounding artifacts. So he gathers as many as he dares and crawls back up and returns, but he can feel he, in an in in um, interview with him in the early 1900s to celebrate his, his 80th birthday, he tells about this childhood um, adventure. He didn't dare to go down too many times because there was this danger of, of the, f the, the roof caving in on him. Um, but he, he has at least an armful of these objects. Um, he cleans himself in a nearby little pond and hides his find in a hazel bush. And he knows that the priest in Thursholt, uh, Ulrich Tigges and Fries, is interested in ancient things and is a collector. Uh, he's an entomologist and, and is most famous for his study of a certain um, uh, type of beetle. Uh, he has even one named after him. Uh, I don't know about those things, but he is. If you if you are an entomologist, chances are you you know about the uh, the work of Fries. However, he was also uh, like Gotthard later, very interested in, in in ancient stuff. And this is a time in Denmark history when, because of the peat harvesting, you start to find the bog offerings. You start to see the the, the great war booties. They are starting to surface again. So uh, Ulrich. Uh, Tigus and Fleece, he was quite enthusiastic when this young man told about his find, and he buys the object for just a very cheap, uh, it was like coffee money, almost. However, the young man, Torben, he's quite happy, he stops his plan of going to the army, and instead he takes to the sea, becoming a um, shipmate, uh, working with, you know, what, what's the word, when you shovel coal for the steamers. And because of that experience, he later becomes an engineer at the Royal Danish Railroads. So he makes quite a journey through his life. But what is interesting for us now is the work done by Ulrich Tigus and Fries, because, oh, sorry, the wrong way. Because of his taking these objects in, in custody, we know about them today. Because he depicted them. In many cases, the objects to, are lost to us today. Some of them are saved just because um, Gotthard managed to buy them back from the collectors that bought them from uh, the priest, uh, Tigus and Fries. But we do have the drawings. 
These were made both for his own interest, but also uh, in correspondence with collectors around Europe uh, to show what he had and to negotiate prices. So uh, it's, it's thought that he made quite a bit of a private fortune selling these objects. Um, the comb uh, he kept for himself, uh, and it can be seen in the local museum of uh, the local historical cultural museum of uh, Thurisol. So if you have happen to have the way by, uh, make sure you look it up on a map to to secure a visit in in uh, Thurisol. It's a nice little place. It has one of those unusual round, uh, round churches, uh, which are typical for the 12th century. Um, we can also see the, the spear, which uh, unusual because it has these, uh, the rivet blocks are in the shape of animals, in this case wolves. But only one wolf survived. And uh, this uh, might have some significance in um, identifying the finds uh, that Linnaeus talks about in his journey to Gotland. Uh, he didn't only go to uh, Lapland, he also visited Gotland in the year 14, no, 1741. And he comes across a local legend um, which has proof, uh, material proof, in, in a treasure. And Linnaeus makes some drawings and makes some notes about these objects and one of the things he notes is um, a brooch in the shape of a wolf that has a hole through its back. So he speculates that it might be a repurposed object that has been gilded and made into a brooch. There are shield bosses, there are uh, remains of uh, metal mounts for horns of cattle, there is a, a gold treasure uh, in the form of Roman solidi, that is Roman military coins. An extremely rich find, and already Linnaeus remarks that since it comes from Rune, which is mentioned in the poem, or almost similar, uh, this might actually be the burial of Beowulf. It comes from a local mound that was leveled, uh, the material in the mound was used for landfill, which was often the case at this time, and the treasure that was found during these excavations, it was kept uh, locally but later on, uh, there's no trace of it today, unfortunately. But we have the description and some drawings made by Linnaeus, and uh, Gotthard remarked on those. Of course, he uh, also knew about that journey. The famed lyre and a s very unusual sword was part of the hoard as well. Uh, this belonged to a banker in Zürich who refused... No, sorry, not Zürich. Um, Dresden, who refused to sell them to uh, Gotthard. He could buy the drawings, but uh, the, the object remained in Dresden and was lost to us in the, in the firestorm in, during the war. But we do have the drawings. And finally, uh, the knife that became the topic of, of my reconstruction. Uh, this came from a diamond merchant in um, Holland. Um, Let's see if I remember his name. Oh no, sorry, it's lost on me. Anyhow, the diamond sh merchant was only happy to sell this to, to Gotthard. Um, and it, this is one of the objects we still have today. Unfortunately, the, the original is very, very deteriorated in rust. We, we can't handle it. Our anonymous benefactor showed it to us, so that was really helpful in, in um, analyzing the drawing and understanding what it was that um, Ulrich Tigges and Fries saw. Today, the dagger doesn't look like this at all. Th there's hardly any remains of the organic material, but the good thing is that the, the material in the blade is more exposed. You can see the grooves, the patterns in the blade, which is quite similar to one of the earlier daggers I showed with those uh, tooth grooves that is similar to the Yuktspring find daggers. So this was the basis for my study. It's a close-up of the dagger and this is the final reconstruction, or almost completed. One interesting element in the dagger is the pommel, which has a rather elaborate silver decoration. And this was remarked on already by Gotthard, saying that 
it really looks like some Roman silverware in style. And indeed, there are Roman objects of very similar nature. And these are the um, fastenings for sword baldrics in the third or fourth century. Uh, the spartha was slung from a shoulder baldric and the leather strap on the backside was secured with one of these, like a big cufflink on, onto that uh, baldric. And they often have these cut-out patterns. Um, in a very recent excavation, this, is, this, was not, this was beyond the knowledge of Gotthard, uh, in 2008 in uh, southeast Germany, no, I'm sorry, southwest Germany, in the Black Forest area again, uh, in the area of a, of a um, sh um, not a, a, well, it's a Roman law, uh, army camp en route. It's not a permanent camp, but one of those temporary camps. Um, they found, indeed, uh, a falera, which happens to be of the exact same design as the one depicted by um, Gotthard Fries back in 1848. So we can be quite certain that the assumption that it's actually a Roman piece uh, silver is, is true. So this brings us back to the case of uh, the dagger itself with the peculiar leather cover where you can see also compared to the other daggers where you have the, the, f the face of that on that broad scabbard. And it was speculated that this might actually be a, some kind of trophy where a defeated enemy was carried like a mark of victory on the scabbard. So a theory forward by Gotthard is that this is like a, 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 like a kind of scalping tradition, that it's the, the flayed skin of an opponent made to be the leather of the scabbard. And this is already forwarded in his uh, article about those unusual daggers, and it was reinforced when he acquired the dagger from uh, Amsterdam or, well, um, Tourist Holt, he uh, speculated that this may well be human skin. So that's why I chose to, to do it like this, based on the drawing and the knowledge that it might indeed be human skin. Um, and with this, I would like to conclude by also concluding the story of Gotthard. It's known that, well, it's suspected that he sold secrets to the Germans before the invasion. He was sympathizing with their ideology, but towards the end of his life, during the occupation of Denmark, he grew increasingly bitter uh, over the brutality of the Germans and the lack of enthusiasm for the cause the Aryan cause of his, of his uh, national fellows, and he, he gradually sank into some kind of depression. Um, he wrote in his diary, just a few months before his death, I wanted to honor the heroes from ancient times. Like them crush weak indecision and vanquish filth and degeneration. Beowulf inspired me, but now I see how I was a slave to Grendel all this time. I came to own weapons and heirlooms of kings. It's a hoard from legend, but now I know that in the darkness, the troll is leering at me. So he's clearly not in a good state. And indeed, a couple of months later, he was found in his study uh, having shot himself. Um, the collection came into the ownership of his daughter, Bente Lewis, uh, who emigrated to the States after the war, married um, a real estate agent in, a agent in New York. Uh, from her descendant, we learned that she had a rather miserable life, unfortunately. The treasure, the hoard, came into his possession when she died, and that concludes the circle and how we came upon the treasure, the fabled treasure of Tursault. And I will, I will make this material available on the Arctic Fire site. If you go to arcticfire.org, 
and uh, you, you will find a banner there where you can also click the truth. And under that, you will see all the additional information you would like to know about this. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you happy adventures.